We want to continue along with the lecture on the universality of sin. And I want to bring us back to that uh, chart that you're no doubt familiar with uh, being in this class. We've returned, we've talked about it often. Uh, Voss is a um, chart on the, uh, the two age overlap. Uh, the idea here is, in terms of, he's representing Paul's thinking here, uh, that what we are dealing with are two different ages. There's the old age, which is passing away. It will be destroyed. That's the sinful, evil age uh, that Christ uh, has defeated and will finally defeat uh, when he uh, returns. And then there's the new age that has been inaugurated, that is, that has been started uh, in Christ when he came and he lived a perfect life, died on the cross, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and sent his spirit. Um, so we have the, uh, the new age um, that has dawned, uh, the old age that is uh, been passing away, but the new age that has come. And we live right now, um, it is after Christ's resurrection, but before his return, we live in the overlap of the two ages, where the old age has uh, been, been judged, uh, the death sentence has been issued on it, um, but it is not yet fully gone, right? The God of this world still uh, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking who he would devour. Um, the, the new age is real. It is true. In Christ, we are raised uh, from the dead. In Christ, we are seated at the right hand of God. And yet, this reality is something that we know by faith, not yet by sight. Um, the, the fullness of that reality has not yet uh, come uh, into being. Uh, we wait uh, with great expectation for Christ to return, and then uh, when he is revealed in glory, then we will be revealed in glory. So, so anyway, just a little bit of review between the old age and the, the new age that has uh, come in Christ. Um, what we want to say about the universality of sin is that this old age um, is not just talking about the really bad people, it's not just talking about, well, put it this way, who's part of that old age? Is it it's not just the really bad people? It's not just some people. It's everybody outside of Christ. You know? The whole world is in this evil age, is part of this evil age, until Christ, by uniting us to him, lifts us out of it. Uh, I was, uh, this reminds me, I was sharing the gospel with um, uh, some high school students one time. Hold on a second. The dog just came in. Okay, come on out. Come on out. Thank you. Okay, I'm back. I was sharing the, the gospel with some high school students one time, and uh, the one guy said, uh, after talking about um, sin, a guy said, "Wow, I used to think that only uh, really bad people were were sinners and headed for hell." And he named a couple of the people who he thought were really bad in in his high school. And he said, "But now I've come to realize that that that's the whole world." And I thought, "Yes, you're onto something here. Uh, you're not that far away from the gospel if you acknowledge that." So uh, what I want us to see here is that in, in Paul's thinking, the, um, this old age encompasses everybody. Uh, we are all uh, part of it. And I want to uh, show how Paul um, uh, explains that in his uh, epistles. Um, <clears throat> here, here's a quote from Ritterboss. Again, I'm taking a lot from him. I appreciate his way of, of thinking here. It's a little typo here. It's supposed to be structures. Uh, he says, here again, the basic structures of the Pauline theology are not individualizing. Um, in other words, what, what Ritterboss is helping us see, and Voss helps us see this as well with the whole age uh, idea, is that it's not just about what God is doing to save uh, individuals as individuals. Uh, God is creating a whole people for himself. Um, and he's doing that by overturning uh, not just the sin in their individual hearts, but he's overturning this whole um, age of sin, this whole uh, cosmic um, uh, pool of sin. 
Um, anyway, uh, here again, the basic structures of the Pauline theology are not individualizing, but redemptive, historical, and corporate. Uh, and redemptive, historical is referring to really that, that Ritterboss's uh, uh, chart there, um, the, the idea that uh, there is a history that, um, that the redemptive work of Christ has unfolded. Um, there's a history of redemption that God is doing in Christ. It is redemptive, historical, and it is corporate. Corporate is referring to the, the group of people uh, together. Um, it is a matter of two different modes of existence, that of the old and that of the new man, which are determined by two different eons. This is another word for ages. And concerning which an all-embracing decision has to be made in Adam and in Christ. That is, either we're in Adam, part of the old evil age, and sinners, or we are in Christ, part of the new age, uh, having been justified and sanctified and redeemed and, um, in, in, in him. So uh, that, that's just a good way to put it, a, a reminder that when we're talking about sin, uh, we have to be looking at more than just uh, the individual. We're looking at this corporate reality. Now, I want to talk about the universality of sin by paying a lot of attention to the book of Romans. Uh, and to do that, let's just look at the outline of Romans. Paul is, in the book of Romans, it gives a, a very clear outline here. It's a very uh, tight argument that Paul is making. And we can see the, that argument if we just look at the structure of how it works. So in verses, uh, in chapter 1 uh, through verse 17 of chapter 1, that, that's the introduction. Paul is just, you know, he's saying, hey, I'm Paul, I'm writing to you guys. And then he, he gives his thesis about how he's not ashamed of the gospel. We'll, we'll get back to that later. Um, really, the whole book of Romans then is talking about what this gospel is. Now, in order to talk about the gospel, though, he, he turns uh, right away to the nature of sin. Um, in chapter 1, verse 18, right? So right after he talks about how he's not ashamed of the gospel, he then talks about how uh, the wrath of God is revealed against all, um, uh, all unrighteousness. Um, and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We'll look at that section in just a second. But here, from you got to realize that from chapter one eighteen all the way through chapter three verse twenty, that's three chapters in a book that's only sixteen chapters long, where Paul is talking about how we are sinners. Um, so, in order for Paul to talk about the glory that Christ brings us in His gospel, he first spends three chapters trying to explain that we are all sinners. And then from chapter 3, 21 to chapter 5, verse 21, um, Paul is explaining uh, justification. And then in 6, 1 through the end of chapter 8, Paul is explaining sanctification. In justification and sanctification are really two ways, uh, two aspects, uh, rather, of the grace that Christ has brought us. Justification is the legal aspect about how we are declared um, to be righteous. We are uh, righteous legally, but then sanctification is about how we are made righteous, um, how we actually become uh, holy, um, not just uh, before God um, because of our legal standing, but before we actually become holy. So justification and sanctification are, are two aspects of the work of Christ, both for us and in us. And then in, in ch uh, chapters 9 through 11, Paul has to deal with a possible objection to his argument. Because, see, as he's talking about the faithfulness of God to bring up this salvation, which God has promised, he has to deal with the fact that, well, what about the nation of Israel as a whole, having rejected Christ? Um, what about that? Does that mean that God is unfaithful? And Paul answers that question. What about Israel? D does that mean that God is unfaithful? And Paul answers no. And then, you know, having explained um, the, the sin and then the salvation that God brings to us in Christ, and then answering that objection, Paul then turns in uh, chapter 12, verse 1, to basically ask the question, okay, how uh, shall we then live? In, in light of all of this, the sin that is, and then what is overcoming Christ, how do we then live? And then Paul has the, the famous verse about um, uh, not uh, being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? Presenting ourselves as living sacrifices before God. That's how we ought to live, um, presenting ourselves before God. 
Um, so anyway, that's the, the argument uh, overall of Romans. For our, uh, for our lecture today, we want to pay uh, close attention to this section here, where in the scope of this whole argument, Paul talks about how we are all sinners. Um, and uh, th- there's another place where the universality of sin shows up, which is in chapter 5. We'll touch on that as well. Paul has rhetorical reasons for separating that out, which we'll get to. But, but the, the main place for the universality of sin is right there in uh, chapters uh, 1, uh, 18 through 320. So, so here's what Paul says, um, chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, again, this is right after Paul has just laid out his thesis that he's not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. Um, then he, he turns to why we need that salvation. Uh, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. I recall some of those words, the vocabulary for sin that we're, we've talked about before, ungodliness, unrighteousness. Um, and then, then Paul says, for what can, he, here's, here's how they suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Here, Paul is explaining what it means that they have, uh, by their unrighteousness, suppressed the truth. To suppress something is to to hold it down, to, to press it down. If you ever had like a a, a ball uh, filled with air in the water. You you press it down in the in the into the water, but it just keeps trying to come back up, right? But you're you've got to constantly push it down, and that's what unbelievers are doing with um, the the knowledge of God. They're they're constantly got to keep pressing it down because it's just it's just always there um, coming up. Um, and, and Paul is explaining how it is that they suppress the truth. Well. Uh, knowledge of God is evident. For what can be known about God is plain to them, right? So knowledge of God is clear to them. Why is it clear to them? Because God has shown it to them. How has he shown it to them? His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So Paul is saying that because uh, of creation, by creation, um, by virtue of creation, God has made his character plain to everybody. Everybody is aware of God's character by virtue of being created by God and living in God's creation. Now, what does that mean? How much of God do we know? Do we know everything about God? No, but we know enough of God to know that he is God. Uh, Scott Oliphant, a theologian I appreciate, says that we know God's godness. His divine nature, the fact that he is the Lord of all. We know that by virtue of being made in God's creation. Now, do unbelievers walk around um, confessing God? Obviously not, right? People deny God all the time. Maybe they outwardly, they blatantly deny God by just saying he doesn't exist, or more often they just live as if there is no God. And that's kind of what God is getting at here. They do not acknowledge him or give thanks. Now, what Paul says about this is that they are without excuse for uh, their um, failing to acknowledge God, right? They can't claim ignorance. They can't claim that God didn't make himself clear to them because God has made itself plain to them, clearly perceived to them. Well, why do they still not acknowledge him? Well, because... They suppress him because they hold him down. And and Paul is saying here that people are without excuse for that. I love this word in Greek. It's actually the word apologia, from which we get our word apologetics, right? Apologetics is defending the faith, giving an answer for the hope that is in us, explaining why we believe what we believe, why our, our faith is reasonable. Paul is saying here that the unbelievers who do not acknowledge him as God, their unbelief is not reasonable. They do not have an apologetic for their unbelief. 
they cannot make a, a, com- a case for why they do not believe in God. Oh, well, one sort of way I like to think of this is if you were to uh, talk to an atheist, um, you know, if you want to be kind of difficult in the argument, you could, you could say to them, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, my atheist friend, God does not believe in atheists. No. I'm not sure that's really going to get you anywhere in the discussion, but, but you could try saying that. And what that's getting at is basically that God does not acknowledge that there is such a one that really doesn't believe in him. All people have some knowledge of him. All people know him. And what, the, what is the atheist going to come back with? Uh, oh, yes, he does believe in atheists. Well, of course not. I mean, that would acknowledge that they're wrong. So anyway, the, the point is that uh, people are without excuse for their re- rebellion, their sinful rebellion and suppression of God's truth. Um, <clears throat> then Paul continues, for although they knew God, again, clear proof that they do not know God, right? In all these ways in which it is plain to them, uh, clearly perceived that they know God, right? That is why they are without excuse. The, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Again, more of that vocabulary for sin. Fu- futile, darkened. Um, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. In other words, people, when they suppress God, they can't stop worshiping. They're always going to worship something, but they worship idols. They worship that which is of creation, right? Creation is a vehicle for God's knowledge. We know God through creation, but the futility and brokenness and hardness of their heart is demonstrated in the fact that instead of using creation to see God and then worship him, they instead turn around and worship creation. And and that just demonstrates how sinful they are. Now, remember, we're talking here about the universality of sin, and this is a class, a passage that I think clearly shows that, because what it shows is that you don't have to have God's special verbal revelation come to you in order to know God and be seen to be a sinner, right? All people um, are sinners because all people know God, and yet all people reject him, suppress the truth, exchange the truth of God for a lie, worship the creature rather than the creator. That is what all people do. Now, sometimes people take this uh, passage and, and think that they can use it to demonstrate that people who don't actually hear the truth of God's word, people who haven't received the law or the gospel, are able to come to uh, you know, worship God rightly. They think that this verse would demonstrate that. These verses would demonstrate that because it shows that we do know God through creation. So is it possible then that based upon this passage, we can, we can construct a theology that says that you know, somebody who's never heard of the gospel before can rightly um, worship God, be in a right relationship with God just through the things they see in creation? And the answer is most decisively no. And why is that? Well, because it's actually completely the opposite of what this passage is teaching. This passage teaches that the knowledge of God is clearly perceived, it is plain and evident, but that people do not use that knowledge in order to come to a right relationship with God. Instead, they universally suppress it. They push it down. They reject him. They worship idols. That's what people do. So so this passage rather than making a case that that we can come to a right relationship with God just through knowledge of him in creation, instead teaches rather the opposite, that uh, although God is known in creation, people do not come to a right relationship with him. They suppress the truth um, in unrighteousness. So this passage, I think, clearly teaches uh, the universality of sin. Now, Paul uh, goes on. We can't follow all of the twists and turns of Paul's argument here. Um, 
you have to do that for yourself or in the Romans class, where Paul eventually gets to chapter 3 to show that all people are sinners. And after talking about how you know, everybody is, uh, is sinners because everybody are sinners because they don't acknowledge God in creation, he turns to the Jewish people in particular, and he talks about how they've received the law, and yet they have not obeyed the law. You see, the Jewish people would think that they are okay before God. We'll talk more about this when we look at the law. But they would think they're okay with God before God because they have the law, as if merely having the law is going to somehow make them all right. And Paul shows very clearly that they have not obeyed the law. And just having the law by itself does not give you any merit. You, you actually have to obey it. And the Jewish people, all people, have not obeyed the law. And so the law does not do them any good, but actually stands as a witness for why they're sinners. So that's Paul's argument um, in chapter 2 and for the first part of chapter 3. And then Paul concludes... Uh, this whole section about uh, how all are sinners, right before he gets to the, the effect of the gospel, he concludes this section by saying, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Again, this is the concluding uh, uh, section here of, um, of this concluding passage on the section on the universality of sin. And um, th th this passage clearly shows that, that all people are, are sinners. It, it uses the language of condemnation. Every mouth um, may be stopped, right? That's that whole idea. We have no uh, excuse, right? No apologetic. We can't defend ourselves in any way. Um, and the whole world may be held accountable to God, right? God is the just judge. He looks at us and and we are held to um, held accountable to him, right? He, he has, uh, has a complaint, a, a rightful complaint against us. Um, and Paul has demonstrated here that by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. And this sets up for justification through something other than the law in the, the next passage that will come. But there's a, a kind of curious aspect to this argument that we would do well to take note of here. And that is why Paul starts talking about the whole world um, in this part of his argument. Because, as, as I said before, the first, so, so we have uh, 118, where he starts talking about the, the uh, universality of sin, to uh, 3, oops, 319. And at first, he's using the language of the whole world, right? Because he's talking about the knowledge of God that comes through creation. But then he turns specifically to Israel and the law. Um, and he talks about how Israel uh, has failed to obey the law, and that shows that they are sinners. Why, then, does he then start talking about the whole world? Because it would seem like uh, he already talked about the whole world in, the, you know, in, in uh, chapter 1. Here, now he's only talking about the nation of Israel. Why does he return to this uh, you know, universal language here? How, uh, in other words, to put it another way, why does the failure of Israel to keep the law show that the whole world is accountable to God? You know, it might seem like Paul has sort of lost the thread of his argument, right? He, he should be saying Israel is held accountable to God, but now he, he switches back to that universal uh, sense. Well, why does he do that there? Well, I think uh, it, it's kind of clear for us if we just realize how Paul is thinking about the nation of Israel. And uh, let, me, let me go back to our, our chart here. Um, this is uh, sort of some uh, amendments, uh, additions that I have made to uh, Voss's uh, chart here. I, I don't think this would be at all counter to his point here, but I'm just trying to use that chart in, in a couple of different ways. Um, and, and I want to just put chart Israel on that uh, the two-age uh, overlap chart here. Um, <clears throat> if we look at the scope of, of redemptive history, or really covenant history, of starting you know, how God is relating to his people, uh, we, we could look at um, 
God's, uh, as some people say, three sons. Um, or, or, you know, in other language, the, the two Adams, and I'm going to say Adam also 1.5, which is Israel. So, so we start off with uh, God's son, Adam, right? And Adam is called God's son. Uh, he's Adam number one. And, uh, and he, and we're going to look in just a moment in chapter five of Romans, he is a representative of all the of human race. And it is his failure that plunges all of humanity down into this uh, sinful evil age, right? Before Adam failed, there was no evil age. Adam's failure is the start um, of this evil age in all, uh, <clears throat> he is responsible for it. Um, we're all uh, part of it. Um, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But, but then we have, as we've already talked about, God's uh, son, um, the Son of God, capital S right here, the Son of God, Adam, number two, the second Adam who lifts us out of that evil age. Um, but in between that, uh, right, in between Genesis 3 and um, you know, the New Testament, we have a whole lot of discussion about Israel. I'm not going to solve all the issues of how Israel relates to everything here. I just want to bring up two, uh, two, two, two things that I think are, are rather uncontroversial. Um, in terms of how Israel functions in Paul's theology, uh, Israel is, uh, well, is Israel part of the evil age or is Israel part of the age to come? Well, the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is both. Israel is God's son, uh, we'll say son 1.5, and that Israel is actually called the son of God, right? Out of Israel I have called my, out of Egypt rather, I have called my son. Israel is called the son of God. Um, and Israel looks points forward to Christ, right? Um, Christ comes out of Israel, right? There, there's the, the whole line, Matthew's genealogy. All, all is, Christ is connected to, to Israel, clearly. Um, the, the prophets are all speaking about Christ. So Israel points to this future uh, age to come. In, in, but Israel also points to the old evil age because Israel uh, demonstrates what happens when uh, sinful people are given God's law? They rebel. And so Adam, number one, was a representative of all human race, right? Israel, uh, as you know, Adam or the son of God 1.5, right, standing in between um, the first Adam and the second Adam, uh, Israel is in many ways put in a similar position as Adam was, right? Uh, Adam was in the garden, told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Israel was put in the promised land and told to obey the law. Adam disobeyed, the transgre Adam committed transgression, um, disobeyed God's clear command. Israel also committed a transgression, disobeyed God's clear command. And just as Adam is a representative of God's human race, Israel kind of points in that way too, because Israel is an example of what a people will do when they have God's law. They will disobey it. So you know, in that sense, the failure of Israel is what, uh, as Paul says, um, makes every mouth stopped and the whole world is accountable to God, because Israel shows that people, when confronted with God's good law, disobey it. So in other words, uh, in multiple ways, Paul is demonstrating not just the sinfulness of Israel, he is demonstrating the sinfulness of all people. In other words, the universality of sin. Uh, now, as I said before, there's, there's two ways in which the universality of sin is, uh, oops, back here, is, uh, is demonstrated in, um, in Paul's theology. Uh, in, 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 uh, not in Paul's theology, in Romans, um, we have in, in the uh, uh, Romans, um, you know, th this whole section is demonstrating the universality of sin. But it also shows up again in chapter uh, 5, where Paul is talking about justification, where Paul wants to make a contrast between the way in which Adam plunges people into sin and Christ lifts people out into glory. Paul doesn't speak explicitly about Adam in this section. Um, if we uh, pay attention to the nuances of Paul's argument, I think we see it's pretty clear that uh, um, Paul, is, uh, Paul has Adam kind of lurking in the background, but he, Adam's not as explicit in that section. Um, Adam comes out more explicitly uh, when it gets to chapter 5, where Paul 
uh, contrasts Adam and Christ, and, and we, we see that here. Um, Romans uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 12, Paul says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death spread, or sorry, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. Um, Paul is uh, contrasting that which uh, came through Adam and that which came through Christ. And um, both Adam and Christ are, are covenant heads. That is, they are representatives of all those who are in him. They don't stand, as, as theologians say, as private individuals, but they are representative heads. Uh, when Adam sinned, it wasn't that he just uh, got all these negative consequences for himself, but he also got all these cons negative consequences for all people. Um, all people are, Paul says, constituted sinners. They are made to be uh, seen as sinners uh, because of what Adam did. And uh, now there's lots of people who would claim, well, that's not fair. I think that objection is raised more so by uh, people in the West who are thinking much more individualistically. Um, I think if we pay attention to how life works, uh, we realize that life really doesn't work individualistically. That's just not how life works. Um, you, if you think about it, uh, we are all, as, as theologians would say, constituted along covenantal lines, which is to say we're all part of something greater than ourselves. And um, for better or for worse, uh, our lot is cast with a, a greater reality. For instance... Uh, say you're part of a nation and that nation goes to war with another nation, um, you don't necessarily need to give assent to, uh, to the governmental leaders in order for you to be at war with another nation, right? You could be drafted into battle. You, could, um, you might be vulnerable uh, to an enemy attack. Um, you are at war um, because you're part of that nation. Right? Now, obviously, if there's wicked, evil rulers and they make the decision to go to war foolishly, uh, that, that's something that is wrong. Um, but it's not necessarily wrong in and of itself for you to be sort of drawn into that conflict by virtue of you being part of that nation. Right? That's just how it works. Um, we are not, um, we don't exist as individuals. We exist as people, part of groups that are greater than ourselves. We're in families. We are in um, churches. We are in uh, uh, countries. That's the way God has made it. Um, and therefore, it doesn't surprise us then that if God um, made it so that we are, are constituted in the covenant head of Adam and his choice um, his wrong action, his act of disobedience has tremendous uh, consequences for us. And so we are, are sinners by virtue of being um, connected to Adam. Now, it's not like, again, we, we, can't, uh, we can't say that's not fair. We can't for a couple of reasons. One, God did it that way, and all that God does is just and true, so we have to just acknowledge that. Uh, but, but secondly, um, uh, we... Uh, you know, this is this is the way life works. I think we have to uh, acknowledge that. Um, but but this is the way God life works also, so that uh, God can bring us a salvation in Christ. Right? If you look at the difference between humans and angels, angels cannot be redeemed because they're not constituted along covenantal lines. That they're in just just individuals, and when they fell, there was no way for them to be redeemed. But because we are constituted along covenant lines. We are made to be in a covenantal relationship. That means that when Adam fell, God could send the second Adam to come and to raise us up from that fall into glory. So, um, yeah, we, we should not object to this idea that we, are, we have a covenant head um, because we have a covenant head that is far greater than Adam. Yes, Adam plunged all of the human race into a sinful existence, yet the second Adam comes to lift the human race or those who are in him, not just back to where Adam was, but into glory.
Um, <clears throat> Ritterboss uh, summarizes this idea well when he says, the universality of sin is not the sum total of separate individual sins. Uh, that, that's not how we should think of the universality of sin, like looking at everybody and then seeing that, oh, individually we're all sinners, and then concluding that, yep, everybody has sin because we see sin you know, here and here and here and here and here and here, and then, and then we get to everybody and realize well, we've all sinned. Rather, um, sin is about this evil age that we're all part of, and we're sinners because we're constituted along that evil age. Now, we're also held guilty for our own personal sin, and, and part of our sinfulness is seen in that we delight in this evil age. We, we want to be, um, in, in our sinfulness, we love that evil age and, and want to make that evil age as evil and pervasive as we possibly can. We, we want to be um, you know, uh, representatives of that evil age and, and try to promulgate it as much as we can, and that shows our sinfulness too. But, but the universality of sin is seen in the fact that there, there is such a thing as this evil age and uh, in Adam, um, outside of Christ, we are all, all of us are part of it. In other words, a sin, um, uh, one way to put it here is that we are, are not uh, sinners because we sin, but we sin because we're sinners. We sin because we are part of this evil age, and that is our nature. We are constituted in that age, and our sin uh, springs up from that. And once we, we realize that, once that becomes clear for us, then I think the need for a rescuer outside of us becomes all the greater, right? We cannot save ourselves. We need a salvation outside of us. And thanks be to God that that is what we have in Christ.